Good morning. As we begin our time of worship, take in a deep breath of God's presence. I'm Pastor Janine Alexander, and on behalf of First United Methodist Church, known as the Copper Top, and Hillside United Methodist Church, we welcome you to worship. Please do share this worship link with others so that they too can be blessed by worship. We want you to know that there is a place for everyone here, regardless of your politics, your gender, who you love, the color of your skin, your financial status, or anything else, you are fully welcome, fully wanted and safe here. Happy birthday to those of you who are celebrating birthdays this week. And if you are celebrating an anniversary or other special event, we celebrate with you. If there is an event in your life, a birthday or otherwise that you want shared in worship, please let your pastor know by Monday of the week before. You will notice in worship throughout the month that we are sharing different contemporary versions of the Lord's Prayer so that we might look at it anew. Today is Human Relations Sunday. First United Methodist Church stands for racial justice and equality, just as our sign says, as does Hillside United Methodist Church. And now, let us move into our call to worship. Hi, everybody. We are a few of the members of the Racial Justice Action Committee, RJAC for short. I'm Jojo Coffin Langdon. I'm Sarah Maddie. I'm Liz Taylor. I'm Anita Zager. Welcome to worship. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Black lives matter to you and always have. Indigenous lives matter. Black LGBTQIA plus lives matter. Black homeless lives matter. Black Christians and non-Christians matter. Black lives with disabilities matter. Immigrants and refugees matter. Black children and teens matter. Their lives are sacred. Their lives are valuable. Their lives are precious. Their lives are important. 
their lives are integral to your magnificent beloved family. So we join with them and all the others who are just as sacred, valuable, precious, important, and integral to your plan of salvation to sing your praises. In 1899, a young poet and school principal named James Weldon Johnson was asked to address a crowd in Jacksonville, Florida for the coming anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Just two decades had passed since the Reconstruction era and lynchings were on the rise in the segregated South. Instead of preparing an ordinary speech, Johnson, with help from his brother, J. Rosamund Johnson, decided to write a poem. He began with a simple but powerful line, a call to action. Lift every voice and sing. For more than a century, lift every voice and sing has held a powerful place in American history. The hymn is known as the Black National Anthem, but it's more than that. It's a history lesson, a rallying cry, a pledge of unity, and as people gather to fight for equality and justice, it is heard across the world at protests and marches, civil rights events, arenas, and concert venues. This song is a prayer of thanksgiving for faithfulness and freedom, evoking the exodus from slavery to the freedom of the promised land. Today, it is featured in 39 different Christian hymnals and is sung in churches across North America. In Ju on July 2, 2020, the National Football League announced that the song would be played or performed live before the national anthem during the entirety of week one of the 2020 regular season. So what is it about this song that continues to resonate with black communities and activists 12 decades later? UCLA professor Shana Redman explains it this way. It allows us, she says, to acknowledge all the brutalities and inhumanities and dispossession that came with enslavement, that came with Jim Crow, that comes still today with disenfranchisement disenfranchisement, police brutality, dispossession of education and resources. It continues to announce that we see this brighter future, that we believe that something will change. Black communities across the globe continue to be vulnerable in very unique and unsettling ways. To sing this song is to revive that past but also to recognize, as the lyrics of the song reveal, that there is a hopeful future that may come of it. Join with us singing in solidarity with people of color all over the world. Please join in singing, lift every voice and sing. Oh, 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 oh,
bright gleam of a bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou hast brought us thus far on the way. Thou hast by thy might led us into the As we move into our time of prayer, get comfortable right where you are. Close your eyes, allow yourself to breathe in the breath of God's presence. God, there is so much on our hearts and on our minds this day. We pray for those lonely and those grieving. We think of those dealing with mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual pain. We pray for all impacted by COVID-19, giving thanks for the promise of the vaccines, asking you to guide us to wise, caring, health-filled choices. On this Martin Luther King Jr. Day, as we celebrate this great civil rights leader, his life and his legacy, we ask you to work in our hearts, in our congregation, in our community, and in our nation. In the many painful events of this year, we have continued to see racism at work and it breaks your heart and ours. Help us proclaim in word, attitude, and action the quality and belovedness we all share. We think of those without shelter and food. We pray for immigrants and refugees and those needing welcome. Use us to find lasting ways to meet human needs and extend your welcome. We pray for our nation's leaders and for all of us who are led by them. Especially this week, we pray for the presidential inauguration. Give authorities wisdom as they plan to offer safety and care in this divisive and violent political climate. Give our new president, his administration, and Congress the ability to honor you by doing what is right, fair, and just for all citizens, especially the poor, the hungry, and the marginalized. We pray that all the people in our nation and our world, irrespective of race, gender, age, sexual identity or orientation, ethnicity or religious faith, be treated with dignity. Move our nation to provide international leadership in the good stewardship of all natural resources that you have entrusted to us. God, there are other prayers on all of our hearts this morning. So now in the silence of this moment, would you hear our individual prayers? We seal our prayers together saying, Eternal Spirit, source of all that is and ever shall be, loving parent in whom we discern heaven, may knowledge of your holiness inspire all peoples, and may your commonwealth of peace and freedom flourish on earth until all of humankind heed your call to justice and compassion. May we find the bread that we need for today. And for the hurts that we cause one another, may we be forgiven in the same measure that we forgive. In times of trial and temptation, help us to be strong. When life seems overwhelming, help us to endure. And thus from the yoke of sin, deliver us. May you reign in the power of human love, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Hi everybody. Today, for children's time, 
we're going to read a story. But it's not just a story for the kids out there. It's a story for all the grown-ups. Because this book is really important. It's called I Am Enough by Grace Byers. You are enough. God made you perfect and beautiful and just the way you are. And who you are is enough. Listen to the story. Like the sun, I'm here to shine. Like the voice, I'm here to sing. Like the bird, I'm here to fly and soar high over everything. Like the trees, I'm here to grow. Like the mountain, I'm here to stand. Like time, I'm here to be and be everything I can. Like the champ, I'm here to fight. Like the heart, I'm here to love. Like the ladder, I'm here to climb. Like the air, to rise above. Like the wind, I'm here to push. Like a rope, I'm here to pull. Like the rain, I'm here to pour and drip and fall until I'm full. Like the moon, I'm here to dream. Like the student, I'm here to learn. Like the water, I'm here to swell. Like the fire, here to burn. Like a winner, I'm here to win. And if I don't, I'll get back up again. I know that sometimes I might cry, but even then, I'm here to try. I'm not meant to be like you, and you're not meant to be like me. Sometimes we will get along and sometimes we will disagree. I know that we don't look the same. Our skin, our hair, our eyes, our frame. But that doesn't dictate our worth. We both have places here on earth. And in the end, we are right here to, lo to live a life of love and not fear. To help each other when it's tough and to say together, I'm enough. I'm enough. You are enough. And God created you special just the way you are. It doesn't matter what skin color you have. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you can do or what you can't do. You are made perfect in God's eyes. And you are enough. This is a picture of my daughter Tiffany, me and Cynthia. Tiffany died this week, and it's been a really hard week. A lot of people, when Tiffany was growing up, made fun of her. You see, she couldn't hear. She couldn't talk. She couldn't really learn to read or write very well. But God made her, too, beautiful and special and in the image of God. You are enough, and God loves you so very much. Happy Sunday. I'm Cindy Hedlund from the Copper Top Church. I'm honored to introduce our next musician, Dr. Connis Nicholas. 
About 15 years ago, Connus and his roommate came to worship at Chester Park United Methodist Church in Duluth on a day we had daylight savings time. They were one hour early for the worship service. At that time, we were having choir practice, so we asked them to join us. From then on, they became part of our church family, and Connus became our choir director following Mike Goodlett. Connus is from Haiti and very musically talented, especially playing the violin. Elizabeth Nelson, also from Chester Park United Methodist Church and now from the Copper Top, contacted Connus and asked him if he would submit music for worship. He is now an assistant professor of music, director of orchestra activities at Missouri Southern State University. We welcome him with open arms. Enjoy his talent on the violin. Hi, I'm Liz Taylor from First United Methodist Church, the Copper Top, and today we're reading from Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 42. Then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. 
he walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. As we've already talked about, today is Human Relations Sunday as we remember and celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Your church council has approved congregational membership in our local chapter of the NAACP. We have an active racial justice action committee in this church formed and led by our own Jojo Coffin Langdon. They meet regularly for learning, conversation, study, and an exploration of how we as a congregation can lead in standing for racial justice and equality. If you are interested in being a part of that, please reach out and talk to Jojo. Thank you to the team for your work in planning and, and leading this service today. And now Jojo will introduce our speaker. Hey everybody, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Daniel Olene Alele. He is a community activist, a husband, a father, the co-founder and producer of Dan San Creatives. He's the busiest guy in Duluth. If there's a social, if there's a social justice problem happening around here, you can count that he will be involved. He is a mover and a shaker. He's the winner of countless awards and accolades. Daniel's an artist, and he is a teller of stories. But most of all, and why we've invited him here today, is that he is a man of God. And I am so glad that he is here with us today to share his heart with you. Um, thank you for having me here today. My name is Daniel Luashei Onyiloye. Um, my talk this morning is captioned this mountain. This day, about uh, seven years ago, January 12, 2013, my father was said to have been sitting at the dining table in our home in Lagos, Nigeria, studying his Bible, as he often does. He was alone, not in the physical sense, because uh, he had a helper who was in his room resting at the time. But he was alone because all he was uh, or all he wanted was to be around the people he knew, the people he loved, uh, the people he had invested his time with, people who loved him. Yet on this night, he was truly alone. He was far from his wife his kids, his families. It was his tradition while studying to put his head down and say a prayer, and his prayers usually had no concept of time. <laughs> um, and knowing my dad, sometimes his tired prayers have the tendency to have him dozing off and on. Well, on this particular day, on this particular night, Death came knocking, and that door was opened. When I got the call, um, I was here in the United States. I was um, at home. When I got the call, I heard news. When I heard the news, it was as if the prayers that I heard of him were similar to that of Christ, which said, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. The verse is Luke 22, 39 through 42. And I'm reading from the New International, um, New, um, at the NLT, New Living Translation, I believe. And the full text goes, then, accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. 
He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. See, I have I had heard and studied and learned about when I was growing up. Uh, I had a love for this charismatic young leader called Martin Luther King Jr., who happened to be born January 15th, 1929. It was something of an epiphany that I came to know why I had been obsessed with his last speech for a few months after losing my dad. I learned that in the present, in the moment, in the moment in time, the mountaintop experience isn't one of great glory. It isn't the romanticized idea of peace. It isn't peaceful. It comes with great grief, great despair, great anticipation, great uncertainty, great burden. And most times it comes with great pain and sometimes many tears. It was in my darkest hour I realized that Martin Luther King Jr. had been to the mountaintop, literally, in the sense of not necessarily walking up a mountain, but in the sense of an experience, that he had seen things that were unbelievable, that he had witnessed his father and his friends fall by the wayside, that he had seen blood, tears, and rain, yet, yet despite all of that pain, it was also at this mountain despite how he felt, despite how Christ felt, despite how my father felt. It was here on this mountain they got a chance to see that the destination they were headed was just. That the destination they were headed was promised. That it was sure. And that not, nothing, even death, would take that promise away. You see, King began his last speech with the following words. He said, something is happening in Memphis. Something is happening in our world. And you know, if I were standing at the beginning of time with the possibility of taking a kind of general and panoramic view of the whole of human history up till now, and Almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, which age would you like to live in? He said, I will take my mental flight by Egypt and I would watch God's children in their magnificent trek from the dark dungeons of Egypt through or rather across the Red Sea, through the wilderness on toward the promised land. You see, he would go on and he would say, something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up and wherever they are assembled today, whether they are in Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, the cry is always the same. He said the cry was always the same, and the cry was, we want to be free. We want to be free. He goes on to say, another reason that I'm happy to leave in this period is that we have been forced to a point where we are going to have to grapple with the problems that men have been trying to grapple with through history. But the demands didn't force them to do it. The year is 19, 2020, rather. We're in the year 2020. In the speech that Martin Luther King made, right after he saw from that view, that paranormal view that he was using as a metaphor to sort of give the speech, he talked about looking through, if he had the opportunity to go through time, that he would look at that moment where the Egyptians, if you, if you studied the Bible, that's the story where the slaves, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, for years and years and years and generations. And then came along this other character, Moses, whose story in itself 
is a mountaintop experience and ends up metaphorically also in the context of the story of the burning bush on the mountain meets her purpose. And his purpose was to set a path to free or to, to challenge the forces of Egypt with a trust in the almighty Yahweh. And God set in motion a series of events that put the people of Israel on a long journey. Now, if someone was telling me, we, we're, taking a, we're taking a hike from, from Duluth, Minnesota, and we're going to go all the way down to Argentina. I'm going to be like, what? <laughs> That's supposed to be good news? I mean, it's not that exciting, but when you think about, will I take that journey or will I take what I'm suffering here in Egypt? For those of us in our context of our time, we can look back at pictures of, of, of just the civil rights movement. I'm not even going back to slavery. I'm talking about emancipation took place and we're now in the civil rights era where folks still didn't have access to things. Folks were trying to do things, but there were still these ideologies, these segregative concepts um, that was not just based on segregation, but was based and rooted in still white supremacy and hate. Was still going on in the era and you had you know, the police with their dogs and, you know, harassing folks. And you had um, spaces where you felt like you don't belong. And you, you felt like your, your whole identity was just not up to a regular human being. And that was post even slavery. Now imagine being in slavery itself where people were being breeded and, and things that were horrifying were happening to human beings. People were being um, treated less than anything, not even cattle. And then someone told you, let's take a hike. Let's take a hike to Argentina. And in Argentina is a land that is ours. You pack your bags. I know I will. And you will go. And you will be so happy. Because when Martin Luther King described that event, that if he had a chance to look at it, he described it as a magnificent trek. Not because he was so happy that this was the best moment in history or that there was so much joy but that he understood the magnitude of pain it takes for someone to dream of a place much better than the one they are in. The mountaintop doesn't feel good. It is the epitome of pain and sorrow. It is the epitome of what we humans do to each other but it's also the opportunity to see what's possible, what's to come. Just this summer, Judge Floyd was another reminder of this problem that we have to grapple with. Breonna Taylor was a far cry for these problems that just like the, pet, the, the days of hold, our elders, our leaders, our ancestors had to grapple with this problem and create the circumstances it takes for us to be able to move. We in our time will have to sit and actually have real conversations, real dialogue and, and real action and create the circumstances to force these conversations to be had and to force the institutions to make way for this journey to a better place and a better time. These are the names that are reminding us of this problem we have to grapple with. Because if we don't, then we are just going to be a generation that feel powerless, that we do not have the power in us to reason to challenge, to stand up, to seek, to ask, to climb to the mountain. All these lives and names were beautiful lives that came after. They came after, people came after, institutions came after them with bullets, with force with swords, with clubs, 
with whatever you could think of, stones. They came after people who had nothing, who did nothing. They came to arrest them. Their intention was to, to capture them, to bound them, and eventually kill them. Well, then Jesus spoke to the leading priest, the captains of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him. He said, am I some dangerous revolutionary, he asked, that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment. This is your moment, the moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. That was found in Luke 22, 52 through 53. There was a moment for the powers of darkness. There was a moment where the reign, both political reign or the reign of the folks in the temple who were hypocritical, there was a moment for them to exert their power on the innocent. And you must have felt this too as an individual moving through society where you're trying to do right by the people you care about. You're trying to do right by those around you. But yet you feel a moment of darkness and you're wondering whether you're loved by God or you're wondering whether, whether it's you. You're wondering whether there are things in your life that you're doing that is causing you to feel all of this havoc and all of this pain. The logic seems right. The craziness of this is, I think of it as a mountaintop. I think of it like MLK thinks of it. I think of it as a moment where you carry all of the weight of despair that presents an opportunity for you to see what's to come. On this mountain, Moses found his spark burning up a tree. On this mountain, MLK watched as Moses and the Israelites set out on a long journey to freedom. On this mountain, we can arrive at the promise that is already in play. Friends, on this mountain, we weep. For George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and all those before, Trayvon Martin, all of the names mentioned, in all sects of society, on this mountain, we, we call, we pray, we rest. Like Jesus was praying on that mountain and he would come back to his disciples and they would sleep in because they were tired. They were tired. They were doing task after task, here after here, and yet they were still being hunted after. Their master was to be arrested. For what? You talk about the black experience in America today, same thing. You hustling 24 seven, trying to make ends meet to pay rent. You could barely make your rent. You don't have people who automatically think you're a good person just by showing up. Yet you go outside, you're being hunted. For what? Translate that to any other community, LGBTQ community. You do your best in everything that you can. Yet you feel like there is just this extra force of darkness hunting you and sometimes we take it to ourselves and we think we've done something wrong the disciples were tired so they slept and Jesus woke him up and said I need you to pray and he went back up there and he continued to pray he continued to call to weep on that mountain friends we can see Yahweh's will Yahweh's promise, on this mountain, we will find the confidence to say these words. Well, he said, MLK, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. 
But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people, we as a people will get to the promised land. And so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And then I hear that speech over and I grippled with it in San Francisco after I left the loot, after dad's death. I grippled with that sermon, not just the sermon context because I was a black American living here and also trying to grapple with American society around race. I grippled with it because there was something in that message that I felt everyone thought they understood but didn't. And to me, as I reflect on that, moving backwards, and being in that room, I remember being in the room in San Francisco where I wrote my song. I wrote a song called Mountaintop. Um, and, and, and the whole experience of that song or writing that song was coming to terms of what the sermon meant to me. That it's okay, Daniel. It's okay wherever you are. What are you grieving? Whatever you're going through right now. That's what it is. That's what Martin Luther King was talking about. He wasn't saying he was at a place that was so... So, so with diamonds and golds and had everything that he, he possibly could want in life and he could see everything that we all were going to get there before him. He was saying, I have suffered just like you have. He was saying, I have wept. He was saying, I've woken up all night. We strategized, we've marched. He was saying, we are still grieving. He was saying, I know this may happen again because I'm not there yet. He was saying, it's not your fault. He was saying, let us seek and focus and ask for the privilege that Yahweh would lead us just like he led the Israelites out. He was saying that there is a promise already at play. Before you thought you had an idea of where you were going, that destination was already there. In my context of my, my, my talk this morning, I talked about Argentina, right? Argentina exists as a place. But if I was walking from here to Argentina, I probably couldn't see it. The context is wherever that destination we dreamt and we know exists inside of us that no one could paint the picture so well for us. We have to gripple with that idea through the problems of our time. With the notion and without dismissing what we've seen out of that despair. It's not always trying to be positive in every space. It's not always going to the school board meeting and say, the only thing we're going to talk about in the school board meetings is, good job, the people who did great. All the good awards, we're going to give their awards. We're not going to talk about the issues. We're not going to talk about the problems. There is no experience of positivity if you don't address the issues. There is no evolution from our time with the issues that we deal with if we cannot see the complexity in what it takes to get there, not even the master we worship as Christians, for him to cry to his father and say, it feels uncertain, but I'm trusting you. Who are we then to say, oh no, everything is fine, when we know it's not? In my book, that would be the definition of arrogance. It is not arrogant for you to say everything is not right. Let's try and solve it. It's not arrogant for you to say, I deserve better as a human being. And I am a human being that God created. What is arrogant to say is that I, there is nothing wrong with me and there's nothing wrong within my world and my world is perfect and everything is fine and I'm just going to live in this ideology. I'm calling you and everyone. Going to the mountaintop doesn't mean we have to die the next day like my father or MLK or everybody else mentioned. It doesn't have to be that. We live in a world where obviously things like this happen. But going to the mountain just means acknowledging that you are in pain, you have your own problems, you have your own issues you're grippling with, you have your own things you need help for, 
you have your own people you want to come with you to help pray with you and saying that I see possibility I see a promise and using the opportunity in that moment of despair to see a promise and not, not just thinking that that problem is the end result of what there would be. It is the promise that makes you walk down that mountain ready to face whatever is to come. That's what the mountaintop means. That's what it meant to me. My dad would teach me about Christ in the most practical of ways on walks in the woods, showing me fruits that are eatable and those that you shouldn't eat because uh, they're poisonous, of course, in the woods. He would show me slideshows of his trips, especially when he had a chance to visit other countries. He would sing songs in baritone and bass and make jokes. It would often remind me to rest and pray. See, Christ lived and struggled and grieved too. A relatable character that was targeted unjustly a character that knew what it was like to be alone and face death alone and instilled and taught all he knew to those he left behind. That Christ gives us all the hope we need to know that our path, like our fathers and our forefathers, ancestors, who journeyed through the wilderness and found themselves praying on the mountain alone, alone for God's will. That Christ gives us hope. So, when will we get to the promised land? Eventually. But first we have to go to the mountain. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for that great word. Thank you for preaching the good news. Thank you for offering yourself and sharing yourself to our community. We want to thank you all for sharing yourselves with our churches, and we want to thank you for your continued giving and your support of the ministries of Coppertop and Hillside. And we just want to remind you that you can send and mail in your offering anytime. You can drop it off at the church during the week. Also, if you are a member at Coppertop, you can give online. Thank you for remembering your churches during this difficult time in our world. And so now as we think of ways that we can offer ourselves, as Daniel offered himself for us this morning, let us pray and let us offer what we have and who we are to God. Faithful God, you powerful, powerfully bring your saving help to all who cry out to you, all who pray. Your goodness and your presence is with us. You have drawn us together at this very time to be nurtured and to work together to offer encouragement and hope and love to each other and to our community and our world. Thank you for the things that you give us and thank you that we can share those things with others. Bless our offerings this week. In your name, amen.
Wasn't it good to be together today? And Daniel, thank you so much for sharing with us. Make sure to stay for the postlude. Worship isn't ended until the postlude is finished. Next Sunday, I'm going to be talking with you about what it looks like to be led by vision in our lives and in our church and, and how that can help us during the challenging times. So make sure to join us next Sunday at 10 a.m. But for today, let's be thinking about our commitment of standing for racial justice and equality. And let's live that out in our words, in our attitudes, and in our actions until all people are treated equally and seen as beloved. And when that happens, the whole world will experience hope and healing. May it be so. Amen.